my lovely, lovely imps. Elden Ring. DLC. Shadow of the Erd Tree. Skidoo Fragments. You've heard it all. I'm sure, whether you want to or not, whether you're an Elden Ring FromSoft fan like I am, or whether you're not, you've almost assuredly heard all of these things. And alongside of them, you have probably also heard a lot of people talking about difficulty. You have probably heard people going this way and that way and all over the place about difficulty in video games, and specifically about difficulty in Elden Ring. Just so that you're aware, the discourse around difficulty in Elden Ring got so intense that Elden Ring gamers, in fact, review bombed the new Elden Ring Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC. Okay? This is 26,893 reviews with a mixed rating. Now, I want to just be clear in no uncertain terms. There is no world in which Elden Ring Shadow of the Erd Tree is a mixed game. Like, that has, it's, it's partially terrible and partially good. There is no world. It is, that, it is, that is just a level of, uh, disconnection with the reality of a product it's, uh, it's not realistic, okay? And I understand, I'm not saying that people aren't entitled to dislike a game, but the, the baseline quality level in Shadow of the Erd Tree is phenomenal. Um, it is a massive, well-fleshed-out, beautifully designed game. It has flaws, which I'm going to talk about, but there's no world in which this game is a, is a mixed bag, okay? Like, in, to that level. That's, that's like saying, like, Ocarina of Time is a 5 out of 10. An insane thing to say. You know, just, just, there's no reasonable world in which, uh, you have to be a hater. A genuine hater. You have to be incapable of understanding what might make something incredible, or even interesting, or even good. It's willful, right? And if you go and read a lot of these negative reviews... It is people very, very angry about the difficulty. These are just a few examples. This was by a creator that I really respect named Zeostorm. As you all know, I've been a longtime fan of Zeostorm. Uh, if you haven't seen his stuff, go check it out. Zeostorm. Uh, real easy to find on, you, on YouTube. He's an Elden Ring content creator who does some of the best videos out there on Elden Ring. Um, quick, snappy, interesting, full of information, loves Zeostorm stuff. But he was talking about how many negative reviews there were. There were a phenomenal amount of negative reviews about, uh, talking about the difficulty of the Elden Ring DLC. And I wanted to talk about this because, uh, difficulty is a topic that pretty much constantly comes up, um, around FromSoft's games. And uh, most of the ways that people talk about it is not, it does not really make a whole lot of sense to me personally. Um, and some of that is like, you know, it's just, a, it's just people's assumptions that they have coming into it. And other things are just a culture of people being unwilling to meet a piece of art where it is at. Um, weren't people saying this about the Ring City? Yes! And in fact, I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Um, a very, very controversial, co wow, controversial DLC for a previous From Software game, the developers of Elden Ring and all the Dark Souls games, um, was a DLC called The Ringed City. The Ringed City was for Dark Souls 3, and it is, in my opinion, one of the greatest DLCs uh, that has ever been released for a game, ever. Uh, it is incredible beautiful, high quality, full of stuff to do, very, very challenging. And people hated it when it came out. Part of the reason is the same reason they're mad at this DLC. It was very difficult. But the thing is, the difficulty 
is kind of a hard thing to define when it comes to these games. Uh, especially when it comes to Elden Ring. Most people would agree that Elden Ring bosses are some of the hardest uh, ever to be made in the Dark Souls series. On just like a basic level, how many moves they can do, how fast they attack, how hard they hit, all of these things are very uh, aggressive and they're tuned out of the favor of the player. However, at the same time, there are a lot of players who go into Elden Ring and find it kind of easy in comparison to the older Souls games, even though the bosses are technically like tuned way harder. If you were to go play Dark Souls 1 right now and then jump right into Elden Ring, it would strike you immediately how different the bosses are. The most crazy boss in, in, in Dark Souls 1 has what appear to be baby combos by comparison to the first boss of Elden Ring. The first boss of Elden Ring, Margit the Fell, is a guy who wields two weapons of differing sizes, a, a dagger and a, a golden hammer, and he also has a tail claw. He can do flips over your head. He does six hit combos with his weapons. He can hold his abilities to trick you, and he can use magic. There isn't a single boss that hard in the entirety of the Dark Souls 1 game. And yet, there are bosses in Dark Souls 1 that when you go fight them, they feel harder. So this whole concept of difficulty is very complicated. Part of the reason why some of the bosses in Dark Souls 1 are harder, even though they're not as complicated, even though they're not as... They're not, they don't they don't require as much memorization. They don't require they don't they don't have as many tools. Is because you have less tools, and because the the systems that are at play, swinging is slower, recovery times are slower. You can't animation cancel, meaning you can't like interrupt a swing by rolling. You have to wait until your character recovers from swinging their weapon. Uh, and in Dark Souls 1, you actually only have, when you're locked on with your camera, you can only roll in four directions. Whereas in Elden Ring, you can roll in basically, uh, I think it's like nine, what is it, six directions? Three, three? I think it's, I think there's three, but there might even be half steps. In Elden Ring, you can roll all over the place. You can roll in whatever, while you're locked on, while you're locked off, doesn't matter. And... In Elden Ring, you can jump over stuff, which is something that tons of players neglect. There is an unbelievable amount of abilities that you can jump over in Elden Ring. You can't do that in Dark Souls 1. So, all of this is to say, difficulty is really complicated. Now, I was tying the new Elden Ring DLC to the Ringed City DLC which of Dark Souls 3, which also suffered from negative reviews at release. And one of the things that I've found is very similar between the two of them is that both the Elden Ring Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC and the Ringed City both require a fundamental rethinking of the approach towards the game. And this is not true for most uh, uh, other DLCs, and it's not really true even um, necessarily between games uh, in, in the Dark Souls series, although between like Dark Souls and Bloodborne or Bloodborne and Sekiro, it definitely is. When you go from Dark Souls 3 into the first DLC, Ashes of Ariandel, you can basically play more or less the exact same way that you were playing when you ended Dark Souls 3. When you go into Ring City, if you try to play the exact same way that you played in the base game, you will have a bad time. You won't necessarily have a bad time, but you're going to have a hard time. An example of this. Enemies have big health pools. They're more complicated. They deal more damage. And there are more of them. All of this means that if you try to like march through an area and kill every enemy that you see in order, which is something that's totally viable to do in the base game of Dark Souls 3, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to find that the enemies are really, there's like a lot of really high health enemies that deal a lot of damage. 
And uh, while it works at certain points in the DLC, you can't do it for all the DLC. For the DLC, you have to change your tactics on a fundamental level. You can't just fight everything you see up front. You gotta get dirty. You gotta be willing to run around things. You gotta be willing to sneak around things. You gotta think and look for where you're trying to go so that you can progress. And this is a struggle for a lot of players. One of the things that a lot of players um, have difficulty with is personal adaptability. And I say this as somebody who also struggled with this for a really long time in these games. Um, and it, was, it wasn't really until Elden Ring that I had fully internalized the need to uh, go with the flow. Um, out of fear, when I used to play Dark Souls 1 and even Dark Souls 3 the first time that I played through it, and maybe even the second or time I played through it, I was always scared that I was going to get owned by bosses. And as a result, I would have a tendency to retreat to tactics that I knew would work. Things that I was comfortable with. And I would stick to them and I'd be like, this is what lets me beat the boss. I would stick to that tactic. And Sometimes that works great. But in the DLCs, specifically in Ringed City and Shadow of the Erd Tree, both of these DLCs are attempting to sort of bring something new to the table. They know that they have devoted players, players who are hungry for a challenge. Difficulty in Souls games is a part of the storytelling. It is a part of the experience. It is a flavor, like 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 spice in a spicy dish. It, is, it adds something to the game. It gives a sense of stakes. It gives a sense of accomplishment. And players are hungry for that. They also kind of fear it a little bit. So a lot of players have come into Shadow of the Erd Tree and in a similar position that players came many years ago into Ring, the Ringed City, where they are not ready to, uh, they're not in a position where they're ready to, to, to adapt, to start changing the way that they play. A perfect example of this is in the Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC, when you first enter the game, very close to the entrance of the DLC, there is a little mausoleum. If you go down into that mausoleum, there is a knight. That knight is very difficult if you, right off the bat he will basically kill you the second you walk into that room he's a heavy armored knight who moves really quick he has a lot of new tricks up his sleeves and his health pool is gigantic now a lot of players encounter that guy and simply will not stop fighting him they will not consider going and looking at anything else. Even though there's t literally an entire world in front of them. Because they encountered this knight in the first spot, they will just keep going at it. Now, some players will be able to get it so good, they'll be able to practice so well, that they'll be able to beat him even with all of the advantages stacked against them. But the majority of players are going to start getting frustrated, and they're going to go, Ah, this guy's so hard, it's so unfair! And instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to mark this guy on my map, which is a tool that you are given. Every player can put little markers on their map. Instead of marking him on his map and saying, I'm going to go look around and see if I can find some tools to use against this guy, they'll just keep going at it. I would be willing to bet that a lot of the players that negatively reviewed this did this on one of the first few bosses. I imagine a number of those negative reviews were from that very night. The first night that you can encounter if you happen to choose to go left. Now, if you went right, just a little ways, you actually would find an item that would make you notably stronger against that knight. An item that everyone can use. It's not even a build-specific item. All you have to do is go right. And guess what? If you go center, you find another one of that item. And if you go center a little further, you find a third of that item. Items that would help you kick that knight's ass. But because people were used to, they got into their groove in the base game of just punching through everything that was in their way with their little tactic that they got, they run into this guy with a big tool set, a big new tool set, and they can't, they just can't deal with it. They can't think that maybe I gotta go somewhere else. And the game literally even communicates this to you. 
it actually is uh, shockingly blunt with its communication uh, in a way that most of the Souls games are not. Most of the other Souls games like to communicate things indirectly, but in this DLC, there's a number of points where they just straight up tell you. When you walk in there, all you got to do is walk a little bit forward and the game literally says, hey, you want to look for these little fragments that will buff you up. Everybody calls them skidoo fragments. It's actually the old English word for shadow. Uh, it's, it's spelled S-C-A-D-U. And S-C in Old English is sh. And U is more like O. So it's shadow. Shadow tree fragments. But I always call them skidoo fragments as well. Which is great. Um... Uh, people completely neglect that a literal pop-up comes to tell you, a tutorial pop-up comes up to tell you, hey, you gotta go grab these fragments. They're a big deal. They're a major progression item for this expansion. Additionally, this DLC is a DLC on a game that is already catered to players who have a high tolerance for certain types of difficulty. And the type of difficulty that a lot of FromSoft players like is, is a difficulty that doesn't soften itself for you. It wants you to adapt to the circumstance and you to come up with tactics, not, you know, it bends for you. And so, uh, in a DLC for a game that already is like that, I think it's fair for them to say, all right, we're going to make this a little tougher. We're going to crank this up a little bit. Um, we got we to gotta crank it up just a tiny bit. Because a DLC is meant to be, it's meant to be where you experiment a bit beyond a main game. And especially uh, for this one, and this is why I draw so many comparisons to the Ringed City from Dark Souls 3, they are both DLCs that on a design level are in conversation with their own base game. There is a, there is a, there is commentary in the design. Here's something we did in the base game. Here's something we want to do here. Look at where we're going. Look at where our mind is going. Think back on where you were and where we are now. And this is very present for both of these. Um, and a lot of just a lot of players really struggled with that, and it was it was very unfortunate. Another thing that I saw was players just outright refusing to use their tools. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking like they're not even looking for the skidoo fragments. I'm saying they wouldn't even consider trying throwing items, pots, summons, rune arcs. Uh, alternate healing items that this expansion gives you. This I, this expansion gives you a repertoire of new items. And I have seen videos and videos and videos of people raging at this game and refusing to use any of them as if it's like a point of pride to like not use tools that are at your disposal. I don't know. There's a weird thing. And I don't know exactly where this happened and like what brought it in. Somewhere along the line in Dark Souls, challenge runners became perceived as like the real way to play. And, uh, and I don't understand why, because I don't even think challenge runners act like that. Challenge runners don't claim when, it, when a challenge runner is beating the entire game naked with a stick item. They're not claiming to be the right way to play the game. They're doing their own challenge for their own reasons. It's very weird. I don't quite understand where the idea that there's only, that there's like only one way to play the game, like where that came from. I don't know where it came from. I wish I knew. I've been playing these games for a long time and I've always perceived them as difficult, but I've never understood where like where it originated from. There was a there was a section of Dark Souls 3 players who used to hate on magic, using magic at all. Which magic builds 
like pyromancy and uh, pyromancy in Dark Souls 3 was a fucking amazing. And, and, and magic was really fun, but also really actually kind of underpowered. And yet everybody said, oh, you're cheating. You're not cheating at all. The designers put love and care into an entire magic system. They built entire items specifically to be used with the magic. So where does the idea come from that like you're cheating or something by using magic? The same thing goes, by the way, super hardcore for this thing in Elden Ring called sh Spirit Ashes. Spirit Ashes are like a little friend that you can summon. And there are literally like 30 different ones or more all of them are little friends with storylines. They're amazing. It's, it adds so much to the game to play with Shadow, with, uh, with Spirit Ashes. You can get a bird. You can get a little goo blob. You can get a wolf that fi fights with you. You can get a pack of wolves that fights with you. You can get a little snake. You can get a, a, an imp that has a giant head that spits cannonballs. And they're just your little buddy that helps you fight. And they're like lovingly crafted lore was written for every single one of the spirits and people are like nah if you use those you're full of shit and shadow of the Erd tree kind of puts a sock in the in the mouth of those people ties them up in the basement and splashes them with cold water because the dlc is very hard and if you are not willing to use the tools at your uh, uh, you know, at your fingertips, you're going to have a hard time. And you're just missing out on something that's really fun. When I played the DLC, I beat bosses. I respect four times just in the DLC. Completely changed my build and switched items that I was using four separate times in the DLC because I thought that would be the most fun thing to do. One time I switched just because I was kind of getting bored of my current build. And the other three times I switched because I thought that a, I had an idea for a build that would help me do really well in a certain area and against certain bosses. And I had a blast with it. I beat bosses solo. I beat bosses uh, with, with spirit ashes and without spirit ashes. I beat bosses with and without summons, NPC summons. And I beat bosses with and without player summons. In fact, I'm going to admit something to you all. I beat the final boss of the DLC. I practiced against that boss probably 30 times. And I finally beat it when I summoned this beautiful character. I saw this character's golden summon sign and I was like, wow, you are, you have a sick ass outfit. Your character looks beautiful. Come help me. And when I summoned them in, they leaned down and did this, they did this, this motion like this, which is called let us go together. It's a, it's a very specific, kind of looks like they're proposing to you, honestly. I use it all the time now. Um, and uh, they, they gave me that one and I knew, I knew that moment that we were going to do it. And so me and a single gold summon walked in and we fucking did it. Finally, we aced it. Seeing that other character come in, another player make my cute, make a cute little emote towards my cute character filled me with hope. And we aced the boss and it was amazing. And at the end we were jumping and emoting at each other and saying, you're beautiful and hello and all of that. And it was sick. It was so fucking awesome. There are people out there who are hard stuck on that boss, who are mad. They're having a bad time. And they could have summoned Alana Kareem. That was what her name was. They could have summoned Alana Kareem and had the, the moment of jolly cooperation that I had. And they won't because of pride. It is so sad. It bums me out. And that's not to say that people who want to solo the final boss 
are wrong. People who were really driven to solo the finer, final boss often have a good time, but they also know that they're in for a long haul, okay? They also know that they're going to be there for a long time practicing. But there's a lot of people who feel for some reason like they have to do the game a certain way and they're missing out on fun. Can I tell you the number of times that... Uh, look, I got a meme for you, in fact. I got a meme for you. Extremely, extremely minor uh, spoilers for one boss. Minor spoilers, okay? I'm telling you, really minor spoilers for one boss. Nothing major. This boss has been showed off all over the place already, okay? I want to show you this meme, okay? Ready? You guys want to see a great meme? Just watch this. This gives you, this will sell you on what I'm talking about with the, with the spirit ashes, okay? I can't play the music. Dun, 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 dun. There you go. Right over here. No! The spirit ashes takes a hit! Boom! No! Ah! Avenged! <laughs> Actually amazing, okay? And you can't have that moment of avenging your little mimic tear unless you're willing to be brave enough to play the to play the way the game wants you to play, okay? Elden Ring, especially the DLC, wants you to crank out those tools, okay? And when it doesn't, it will communicate with you. For example, I'm going to give you another example of this, okay? There are a number of bosses in the DLC, especially towards the end, that are that have absolutely enormous health pools that get even bigger if you summon two players. So the way that the the way that summoning in Dark Souls works, bosses get more HP for more summons that you get. And if you have two summons, they have a lot more HP because obviously if you have three people, you could you can share aggro so the idea is that it balances out by giving them more HP. But if you think about it a little bit for a second, if there are bosses in the DLC that have large health pools, they get really big with three people, what they're communicating to you is, hey, maybe consider only having one summon for this boss. Unless you really want to commit to a big fight, you can do that, but it might be smarter to just go with one summon, or it might be even smarter to do it yourself just by yourself. There are bosses that I summoned for, and then I realized while looking at that boss, I went, hmm, actually, it would be easier for me to try and solo this boss. So I soloed the boss, and I won. The game communicates this fairly well. There's a boss like this, by the way, identical in Dark Souls 3, The Ring City. There is a boss in The Ring City that's a giant dragon by the name of Medir. He is a boss that is designed to be soloed. You can summon for him, but when you summon, um, his health pool gets really big and it becomes difficult to manage his aggro because for this particular boss, it's actually best if you can keep him focused on you because you're supposed to be hunting a dragon and that's the fantasy they're trying to sell. They let you play how you want, but it's sort of softly communicated. Well, in this case, a little bit harshly because it's a, it's a, this, in, in that one, it's the second DLC of the game. There, it's sort of telling you, hey, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle if you're summoning three other people to fight with you. Consider fighting it one on one. I unironically hate Medir. I hate that fight so much. Medir is, Medir is one of the best, is perhaps the best Dark Souls boss fight that has ever been made. Like, I can't think of another boss that I like as much as Medir, as far as j just on a raw fight level. I've never gotten as much of a thrill, and I've also not died as much against a single boss as I have against Medir. Yes, 
Great, exactly, yes, Maya Ostro. Maya Ostro says, both of the Black Rabbit Brotherhood fights in Lies of P also felt like they were teaching you that sometimes summoning can have drawbacks. Exactly. Exactly. Gale is too easy. That's my biggest problem with Gale. Slave Knight Gale is like one of, is like thematically one of my favorites, but he's too easy. They should have made him like at least 50% harder. Frida was hard. Frida was really hard. Easy, you crazy. Both times I've beaten Gale. I've beaten Gale two times and both times it was easy. Please play Elden Ring. It is a beautiful game. It is a absolutely wonderful game. I think Frida is easier than Gale by a country mile. Not for me. I find Frida uh, harder specifically because she has she goes through so many different phases and you have to remember so many different abilities. It's true that she's easier to stagger, which for some builds that can be easier, but I found Gale really easy. Curse you, Bail! I hereby vow you will rue this day. I'll riddle your besotted hide with my harpoons. That guy? Is that who you're talking about? That Egon? Is that the Egon you're talking about? Egon? I didn't like him when I first encountered him, but he really, he did warm up with me over time. The first time I encountered him, I was like, Captain Ahab, really? And then I was like, actually, I actually kind of like this guy. The more the more I played, I was like, actually, you know what, I do like this guy. But the first time I was like, bruh. He's literally Captain Ahab. There's like no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just Captain Ahab. He literally has the Captain Ahab accent. Holy shit. I beat the final boss of Elden Ring before Let Me Solo Her did. What the fuck? Happy to happy to see Let Me Solo Her catching up with the real pros. I wanted to talk, before we finish up on this section about difficulty, I wanted to touch on two things, okay? One, I wanted to, to just touch on an article from the director, the famous director, of Elden Ring, Hidetaka Miyazaki. Miyazaki admitted that he usually does not play his own games. And most interestingly, he also admitted that he did play through Elden Ring. In preparation for Shadow of the Erd Tree, here we go, sorry. Leading up to the release of any game, I'll be very hands-on playing it and getting as much time on it as possible. But after the release, I tend to not want to touch it because I know I'm either gonna find things that I left on the table or issues that bug me. And once I become a player, I'm powerless to do anything significant to change it. So once a game is out in the wild, I tend not to play. By the way, oh my God, I have so much to talk about with this quote. I need to save this quote specifically. Hold on, I gotta save this quote. I have so much lore shit to talk about with this. Oh my God, I'm actually a genius. I hadn't read this article when I was, t when I was writing stuff about the lore the other day, but we'll get there, okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry. In preparation for Shadow of the Erd Tree, I played through the main story of Elden Ring. I wanna preface this by saying I absolutely suck at video games. So my approach or play style was to use everything I have at my disposal, all the assistance, every scrap of aid that the game offers, and also all the knowledge that I have as architect of the game. The freedom and open world nature of Elden Ring perhaps lowers the barrier to entry, and I might be the one who's benefiting most of, of all of that as a player, more than anyone else. I was greatly amused by the image of Miyazaki, controller in hand, tormented by the very world that he wrought, all of its imperfections, which only he would notice. That's true commitment to his game design philosophy of improvement through failure, a creed that seems to permeate his whole life. Miyazaki is an extremely hands-on director, and all of his games bear the unmistakable imprint of his influence. 
but he has also been attempting to pass down his knowledge and artistic approach to others at From Software in the 10 years that he's been its president, ensuring that they too have room to fail. I can't tell you how much it means to me to know that I am not and was not the only person who truly sucked at video games, who made my way through the Souls games uh, by desperately trying to figure out whatever I could make that worked. And that also, I was able to evolve beyond that and genuinely become better at video games. At so many video games, the Souls games have taught me to be better at other games. I am better at every other game that I've played since I played through the FromSoft library. Specifically, Sekiro and Elden Ring. Genuinely incredible. That's the first thing that I wanted to share with you, is that even the creator acknowledges that you should, these games are designed for you to use every advantage that you can get if you're struggling. If you happen to be super good at memorizing patterns, you got it, ace those bosses. But if you're like me, or if you're like director Miyazaki, grab those pots, grab those healing items, grab those spirit ashes, summon those friends, summon those NPCs, grab that fucking weapon that, that some, for some reason vibes with you and beat the shit out of those bosses. Claim victory, please. And then you're gonna, you're gonna, and then you won't even need to leave a negative review because you're gonna see the beauty that the rest of us see in these games. One more thing that I wanted to share with you on this particular topic, and then I'm going gloves off, baby. We're going all in, okay? The last, I'm going into my, my final phase. My HP has dropped below 50% and we're entering into the, into the motherfucking phase two, baby. That's where we're going after this, okay? Reposted by Iron Pineapple, a another incredible uh, uh, YouTube video creator who makes stuff all about FromSoft games and much more. But this is a repost from the Elden Ring subreddit, and I want to read it to you. Okay, I know you know it's got to be good if it's an Elden Ri if it, if I'm reading a Reddit post. Okay, title: I am a bedridden quadriplegic. I cannot move my fingers at all. I have beaten the three DLC bosses and mini bosses so far. I love this game. This is not meant to come off as a brag post. It's just not. I see a lot of people struggling and I want to share if I can do it, I know all of you can do it too. I have beaten the first night in the catacombs, the dancing lion and Rolana, plus a bunch of exploring and unlocking signs of grace and collecting stuff. I'm three and three on blessings and around RL 139. Okay, by the way, that's under leveled. So this is a, this player, soul of gold, okay? Soul of gold, this player, I'm telling you. I was way higher level and I was struggling too. That's crazy, that's so good. I normally join random worlds to see the boss I'm at, to see the boss I'm at for a few times until I feel that I've got the rhythm down before I try it myself, based. Another thing to consider, consider getting summoned yourself to learn bosses without risking yourself. That helps me a lot. And winning there until I feel comfortable helps other players along the way too. Beautiful. Once I'm ready, I fight the boss with my mimic and the NPC if there's an NPC. I just want to encourage people. Gaming gives me life in a world that I'm otherwise confined to a bed. I hope someone who may be struggling with the DLC reading this can find some of the joy that it gives me. I thought the t title was trolling, but you sound sincere, dude. Thy strength befits a crown. And the poster replies, Thank you. I am sincere. I got hurt playing football in high school, American football, when I was 16, year old, 16 years old. I am now 55, a lifelong gamer. Gaming was my hobby since I was 10. For a few years after my accident, I was fearful to even try because my mind said, How? A friend encouraged me to just do it. Just try. And now here I am. I'm impressed, says another user. How do you actually play if you don't mind me asking? I mean, what is your control interface? And the OP responds, I am a console gamer. 
I play with a modded controller, just laying it on my chest and pushing the sticks and buttons around with my two index fingers. It sounds crazy, but I've been gaming like this since around 1987, and it's just natural to me now. Genuinely amazing. Um, first of all, really cool in like four different ways, but an incredible attitude. Uh, and also, I want to point out, loving it. If somebody who is who is is willing to struggle that much to play this game is able to not just not just beat it. It's not like it's not like this poster is saying, "Oh, I beat it." This poster is saying, "I beat it and I loved it. I got something from it." You can too. See? I've seen a lot of people talking about raging about the difficulty, and it is hard. The Shadow of the Earth Tree is a very hard expansion, but difficulty is part of communication in these games. It is part of the artistic vision, and it's hard, but it's hard in ways that you can overcome. That even a even somebody like me who was not good at games, I've this is the first DLC that I've ever like felt like I went into it being okay, and I still got my ass kicked. Okay, I need you to understand, I died a lot. I had to practice against bosses a lot, and I had a great time with it. And I know you can too. All right? Seriously. Anyway, that's all I have to say right now on the Elden Ring Shadow of the Erd Tree difficulty discourse, of which it seems to never end. I want to encourage everybody out there to uh, adopt a open-minded approach to learn to roll with the punches and most of all adapt and evolve these games want you to evolve they want you to change the way you play they want you to introspect and and get better and you will and it'll be worth it and it'll be awesome and you'll fall in love with these games just like i have thanks for watching if you have thoughts about the difficulty discourse or everything that i've had to say please leave a comment down below i'd love to hear from you Thanks for watching Demon Mama.